Communication, communication, communication. From the beginning of time until today, beyond tomorrow, the one intangible that has yet to be conquered. Why are there so many problems in the workplace? Why don't people understand me? Welcome to the class on communicating effectively with the courts and with the public. Good morning. My name is Michael Horn, a consultant with Arizona, Consul uh, Arizona Governmental Training Services. I've been involved in training and development for about 25 years. I'm retired Air Force. I've had the opportunities to travel the world over many times working with refugees. My wife speaks 12 languages, so she is a strong partner in what we do. I've been college educated at various universities around the United States. And one of the things that you probably don't see or read about me in my bio is that I am a diehard 100% Dallas Cowboy fan. Now, a lot of people criticize me for that reason, but I can sit here and tell you very confidently, especially in the court system, that the Cowboys are the only professional organization that participates regularly in community service. Now, sure, it's court-ordered community service, but it doesn't really matter. I'm really glad to be here, so once again, I'd like to welcome you. I would also like to welcome our panel of guests here in the studio this morning who will be sharing their discussions with us, and I would like for them just to take a quick moment to introduce themselves to our audiences out there, beginning with Martha. I'm Martha Anderson, and I work here at the AOC, Court Operations Unit. I'm Megan Hunter, and I work in the Family Law Unit of the Court Services Division. I'm Jeannie Omar. I'm an admin assistant for Education Services Division for Probation Education. I'm Rocky Book, and I'm the secretary for the Facilities Management Department. And I'm Jan Stockman, and I work in Education Services. Thank you very much. Now, additionally, they will be sharing their thoughts and comments, or their uh, thoughts and comments or questions that you may have that you can send to us via the fax machine. So at any time you have a comment or a question, please feel free to fax it to us at 602-542-3721. Once again, that number is 602-542-3721. That's not my job. You're just going to have to wait until you're called. There's nothing, absolutely nothing I can do. Listen. Those are the judge's orders. I don't have the authority to make that decision. You're just going to have to be patient. I'm working as fast as I can. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Sometimes many of us have heard those type of comments. That creates conflict in the workplace. Whether verbal or nonverbal, we often send continual and sometimes very conflicting messages to those we serve. The message that we send is simply, we don't care about you, you're wasting our time. Or the message could simply be, we do care about you. The success or failure of any organization, large or small, public or private, is centered around the effectiveness of the communication processes, both formal and informal. The Arizona State Supreme Court, you, as an individual service provider within this organization, you must pride yourself in establishing and maintaining the absolute best communication practices throughout the organization at every opportunity, no matter what you're doing at any time. Because when you do, you tell the customer, you show the customer that you care about that customer. Customers don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Our communication roadmap will take us on the following journey. As you can follow along inside your handout packet, you'll see eight points that we're going to focus on on page one. Our journey will take us from defining basic and interpersonal communication and helping you to understand 
that communication is not just one way, although simple, it is the basics that causes the most problems for a lot of people. So to keep us on track, we will briefly return to the basics of communication and tie it directly into interpersonal communication. Secondly, we'll try to explain the communication process, understanding that we are both responsible and accountable for the outcomes of the communication that we initiate. We'll try to identify some of the many, many barriers, uh, barriers to communication, both the verbal barriers to communication as well as the nonverbal barriers to communication. With these barriers, some we have control over and we can prevent them from arising, and some we don't have control over. When barriers do exist, however, we then realize that walls have a tendency to go up misunderstandings have a tendency to take place and we can prevent some of these things by preventing the walls from going up by tearing the walls down and keeping them down once and for all now we can't always have success in every communication interaction that we uh, have an opportunity to have but we also must understand that there are people out there that are going to be difficult difficult in terms of how they communicate to us and at the same time how we communicate to them. How do we provide sensitive or difficult information to an individual and still hopefully have a successful interaction? Our final point of our journey is to leave you with some listening tips as we identify some of the various listening areas, but to leave you with some listening tips, how can we improve our listening effectiveness and then finish, in, excuse me, and finish that up with some successful communication tips. Let's go directly into the program. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to fax them to us at any time. And your thoughts or questions or comments will be discussed throughout the session. If you will, turn to page number two. And as you're turning to page two, you will see up on your screen a quote. And this quote is something that many of us have seen or heard at many different times. And sometimes you read it fast and you're saying, exactly, what are they saying? I know you believe you understood what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant to say. And the obvious response to most people non-verbally is a look of confusion. What did you say? I don't understand what you meant. And many times you may think that when you communicate with other individuals, the statements that you make, even though in your own mind you can't get any more clear than you already are, you still are not effectively communicating. So we must understand that communication is and must be a two-way process. The message that is sent must be consistent with the message received and the receiver must respond with understanding. That sounds very simple. In fact, it is simple. But yet, if it is so simple, then there goes that question, why don't people understand me? Well, let's take a look at just that statement. First of all, beginning with the word message. The message is nothing more than the words, the phrases, the symbols that you as the initiator or sender of the communication process that you choose. You must be responsible for choosing the right, the appropriate words, message symbols so that the receiver can in fact respond with understanding. The dynamics of communication are always ever changing. The language of communication are always ever changing. We all know that simple words have multiple meanings. As a result, that leads to breakdowns in communication. Using abstract terms, for example, it is our responsibility, it is my responsibility as the initiator of any communication to make sure that I take and carefully assess the right words, the right messages, the right uh, uh, word, uh, phrases in order to ensure the high probability that my communication will in fact be successful. The breakdown of the basic communication process is the second phrase there that is in red where it says must be consistent. Inconsistency is a primary reason for breakdowns in communication. Oh, I thought you understood exactly what I was talking about. 
and we have a tendency to take things for granted and we're giving broken communication I'll give an example in our church we have refugees from all over the world perhaps about 20 to 25 different language groups represented at any time and we had a young lady who uh, was from Burundi and their primary language is Swahili well she had a little baby and the baby started crying one of the young ladies in our church when she heard that baby crying she just was excited she said oh my goodness the baby is crying American and everybody just stopped and wondered well what in the world did you mean by that she assumed that because they spoke a different language perhaps the baby was going to cry in a different language communication inconsistency is a major problem in communication when we talk to babies we don't use big multiple words and colorful phrases to babies we break it down for the baby here's what I like for you to do just real quick look at the person next to you and repeat the following words goo goo can't hear you try it again goo goo <laughs> now look at the person back to you and say gaga gaga gaga, gaga. now gaga. when you think about that Adults saying goo goo gaga, others who are looking at you and listening to you, they're going to think you're strange. Now, a little baby, we're saying goo goo and gaga to the little babies, and the little baby smiles. But I wonder what's really going on in the mind of that baby. That baby is probably thinking, yeah, you lost it. You, you've lost your mind. And as adults know that we cannot speak goo goo gaga to people, but sometimes when we don't make sense, we might as well say, goo goo gaga to our people what makes the communication the basic communication process work is that last part understanding the receiver must respond with understanding or you wasted your time that means that you may have to restate it over and over again that means that you have to change your message to using something that may be a little bit more meaningful to that individual whatever it takes it is your responsibility don't make the assumption well basic communication is simply our template but we work with people within our organizations and this is where misunderstandings and conflicts and breakdowns in communication have a tendency to arise and that is one reason why I wanted to also include a definition for interpersonal communication you know we can point the fingers at each other we can tell others that the reason I'm behaving the way I am because he said this or she said that it's that person's fault but no matter what happens in our day-to-day -day interactions with other people we must understand that it is our responsibility at all times we must be in control and responsible for our own communication effectiveness when interacting with others no one can say well the reason I'm in a bad mood is because so and so did this Whatever we say, whatever we do, no matter how we say it, no matter how we do it, we are still responsible and accountable for our behavior. We're responsible and accountable for our decisions, our comments, and our actions, and it's no blaming anyone else. Back in the 70s, there used to be a comedian called Flip Wilson. Flip Wilson would put on a role simply as Geraldine, and one of his classic lines was, the devil made me do it. And it's so easy to blame somebody else when we ourselves are, in fact, at fault. So please keep in mind that when it comes to interpersonal communication, none of us have the luxury, nor do we want the luxury, of choosing the people that we work with or choosing the kind of customers that we have to deal with each day. No matter what our moods might be, we are still responsible and accountable for the things that come out of our mouths, both verbally, coming out of our mouths, and, of course, the things that people see non-verbally. The basic communication process is simply this. As you turn to page three, you will see four bullets. I'd like for you to fill in those blanks. First of all, communication is irreversible. Once a word has left your mouth, there is no calling it back. Sometimes we would non-verbally pretend we're rewinding a tape. You can do all the pretending you want, but there's no erasing it. You have now planted something firmly in that mind, a mind of the receiver, whether it's positive or whether it's negative. 
I recall sometimes you hear a parent who is very frustrated with a partner or a child or someone, and they say, gosh, I wish you were dead. I, you can't be mine. And you didn't mean to say that. Even though you didn't mean to say that, you cannot take back those words. So you have to be very, very careful and sensitive to what you say before you say it. The problem with human beings is that we have a tendency to act before, excuse me, to act before thinking. Think about what you say before you say it. And if it's not appropriate, if it's not the right thing, then again, be responsible for the consequences of what you need to say. The second area is that communication is constant. Whether we are talking or whether we are sitting there quiet, we are always communicating, always communicating. It is constant. We communicate verbally and we also communicate non-verbally. We communicate by the clothes we wear, we communicate by the places we go, the food we eat, the things that we do. For example, if you were to walk in my office and you say, my goodness, your office is very, very sloppy. Well, I am sending a message to an individual. That individual may say, my goodness, this person is irresponsible. He or she is a poor time manager. They're not organized. It might not be true at all, but those are the messages that we are always sending. So we can say verbally one thing and non-verbally, we are still communicating. The problem is, as we said in the definition for basic communication, that the message must be consistent all the way through. If not, the signals can be very easily misinterpreted. So we have to understand that not only then is communication irreversible, not only is communication constant, but our communication connects us with other people. It's a type of symbiotic relationship that we have with other people. People are drawn by other individuals, both verbally as well as non-verbally. I'll give you an example. A person who has a reputation for just laughing a lot. There are people that you know yourselves who can laugh and somehow people are drawn to that laughter. And this person may just be laughing and laughing and all of a sudden you kind of find yourself laughing a little bit. What are you laughing about? What are you laughing about? What are you laughing about? And even though you don't know, you are gravitated towards that laughter. If I was to stand out on the street in the city of Phoenix on a busy intersection right there on the corner and just stop and start to look up at the sky, guaranteed others will stop just out of curiosity and start looking up at the sky. I wonder why. Now, I use the word laughter as an example, and I use standing on a corner as an example. But you also must realize that anger, bad attitudes, is also just as contagious. And you communicate that. People know their coworkers who have good attitudes and they know those who have bad attitudes. And even though you may be in a good mood, people already have given you that reputation. They've already established that relationship that when they see you coming, they say, oh my gosh, here he comes. Attitudes can also, it's like a virus, they can spread to other individuals. We communi our communication connects us with other people. You'll notice that there are some who work well together and some who simply just work together, but there's no harmony in that relationship. Whether we like it or not, we must work together with each other. Whether we like it or not, we must provide the best communication service to every person we come in contact with, both our internal customers as well as our external customers. The fourth point is that communication can always be improved. Even the best speakers, even the best communicators seek to improve their communication styles. They seek opportunities on a regular basis to sharpen their communication skills and they practice and practice and practice. Sometimes they look at other individuals, such as a mentor, find out how they operate in certain types of situations, perhaps dealing with a difficult customer, and they learn from those other individuals. They choose their words wisely. They watch how others handle these tense situations. And uh, the great thing about how communication can always be improved is that they know 
when they made a mistake and they tried to make amends to that. We're human. We have a tendency sometimes to do things and to say things that maybe we just don't mean. But the experienced individuals realize through hindsight that if I have the opportunity to do it over again, to say it over again, this is what I would do. Communication does take practice. Practice doesn't, ne doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be perfect. Life is a learning, ongoing learning opportunity, and that's what communication really is too. So the point that I want to leave you with this particular slide, the point I would like to leave you with this particular area is simply this, and you can fill that blank in at the bottom of your page. Always say what you mean and mean what you say without conflict. And I want to say that one more time. Say what you mean and mean what you say without conflict. Don't have that hidden agenda. Don't go into a communication saying one thing but really meaning another. And to help you say what you mean, make sure then that you carefully thought out what you need to say and say it, per, uh, excuse me, say what you need to say and say it exactly the way it needs to be said without any kind of hidden agendas. Keep in mind that it's important that your nonverbals are consistent with your verbal communication. Let's turn to our next page. Our next area is focusing on some of those key barriers to effective communication. And if we are not aware of what we're saying and how we are saying various types of things, then walls will arbitrarily go up. And these walls are simply symbiotic to being a filter. And when we communicate, we understand that some of the barriers to communication are internal barriers. Internal barriers are past experiences or knowledge which we filter that information. And sometimes we have control, sometimes we don't have control. But then at the same time, the external barriers come from outside the environment. These are perhaps from other individuals. These are from situations and circumstances. Sometimes, once again, as with the internal barriers, we have control. Sometimes we do not have control. So what I would like to do is just spend a few moments on addressing eight of the many types of potential uh, barriers to communication. One of the first barriers and the barriers that I I, I, ha I find that I experience on a regular basis, and I know Arizona sometimes is looked at as a type of mosaic of cultures and different people and different values and attitudes. And so I'll, it's fitting that we spend a few moments dealing with culture as a barrier to communication. Now, when we say culture, we're also talking about things such as a person's background or heritage even their customs or practices. Those are just some examples of culture. I know spending some time in Japan and Korea, the simple custom of greeting others, not necessarily through the handshake, but of bowing. And I've learned that the seniority of the individuals gets the longer and the deeper bow. I also recognize that when I spent eight years in the Philippines, what hugging means. When I grew up, or as I was growing up, I recognized that Hugging, it's okay to hug a loved one. It's okay to, uh, for a, a male to hug a female, for example, or a brother to hug a brother. But when I was in the Philippines, I noticed that girls were hugging girls and guys were hugging guys. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, why are they hugging each other? That was perfectly a normal part of their culture. And as I was sitting in front of one of their small stores and one of the guys were playing a guitar, and then one of the young men, we, he was sitting beside me and he put his hand on my leg and I said, oh my gosh, how about those bears? You know, the first thing that came to my mind is, what am I doing? There was nothing intentionally uh, deceiving about that particular situation. It was just a sign of friendship. But these are all part of culture. One of our missionaries to Nigeria shared a story with us about his son getting beat up while hitchhiking. Well, they were on one of the streets in the river state of Nigeria, and as they were hitchhiking, well, of course, the American way of hitchhiking is simply thick, stick out your thumb and hope for a ride. Well, every time they would stick out a thumb, cars would go by, people would yell out the window, and they would blow their horns and go on by. Didn't think anything of it. Finally, a car did stop with three guys in it, 
as they were hitchhiking, they got out and they beat up this missionary's son. What they learned is that sticking your thumb out in America is the same as sticking the wrong finger out to them in their country. And, of course, they were offended. Now, they did learn the hard way about nonverbal communication. I would simply call that a significant emotional event for them. And they probably never would do anything like that anymore. I had learned that eye contact is, is or can be cultural. Eye contact is nothing more than some of us say, well, you must look me directly in the eye when you're talking to me. Well, I also learned that culture plays a big part. In some cultures, eye contact means a sign of disrespect. In some cultures, eye contact may mean that the person is being deceptive, either intentionally or unintentionally. And eye contact also, like the way I was brought up, again, as I stated, is a sign of disrespect. But eye contact is a cultural type thing, and it's not a universal type thing. The second area that I would like to just spend a couple of moments on, and then I want to throw a question out to you, is in the area of language. Language is very diverse. Language is very dynamic. I spent a couple of months in Alabama, and I can swear to you right now, nobody in Alabama speaks English because I didn't understand a word they said. Now, they perhaps said the same thing about me. But now, understanding this, my wife, as part of our missionary team, she speaks 12 languages, and she speaks them all fluently, and she's learned them all within the past two years. And I'm just amazed that every time we go and work with a different family, that she just picks it up and just starts speaking it very fluently, and I just don't understand it. But what I also learned is that there is a correlation between language and the culture themselves. There are so many different dialects out there. There are so many different accents out there. There's all kinds of slang that is out there. I did a program for about 500 teenagers at the Phoenix Civic Plaza a few years ago. It was on diversity. And after the program was over, one of the young men came up to me and said, you know, I really enjoyed that program. And then he said something that still kind of sticks with me. He said, hey, brother, stay black. And I told him I didn't even know that was optional. It's just some of the things that people say and do that really wants you to just simply go, hmm, like the language. Like, I consider myself multilingual. I speak English, I speak Jive, and I speak Ebonics. But that's about the best that I can really do. One young lady said, ooh, that suits the bomb. And the first thing I started looking at that suit, that suit, I'm thinking that something was wrong with my suit or something like that. But that is the language. Well, even the language today when the kids say whatever or talk to the hand, I don't understand that, but there's all kinds of languages out there and there's all kinds of cultures that are out there. And as a service provider, especially when we're communicating to other individuals, we have to be responsible for breaking it down so that that individual can understand exactly what we mean. I had a few meetings with the Department of Economic Security uh, working with our refugees because most of them are receiving some type of public assistance. And part of this public assistance is that they get forms in the mail. One side of the form is either English, one side of the form is, either, uh, is, is perhaps Spanish. They don't speak either of those languages, so there's obviously a breakdown in communication. They're speaking Arabic, they're speaking Dinka, they're speaking Karundi. The languages really go on. As a customer provider, you must recognize that when people come into you, English may not always be their primary language. And even though you have been blessed with a vast vocabulary, and even though you have been blessed with patience, it will be stretched sometimes. Our family from Kosovo that spoke Albanian, they're learning, they're speaking English pretty good now, but when we first met them, they spoke no English, and myself and our senior pastor, my wife wasn't with us, neither one of us spoke any Albanian. So we try to communicate with them about what kind of foods do they eat. We thought they, under, uh, they spoke, uh, excuse me, that they, they ate pork. Well, we learned that they didn't eat pork, but the way we communicated is that my senior pastor got down on his hands and knees and started in the parking lot actually oinking around. Now, some of them started to run because they thought he had snapped. And perhaps he is a couple of French fries short of a Happy Meal at times. But communication is so dynamic, they understood eventually what we were trying to do. 
It was a laughing type of situation. But can you imagine the potential misunderstandings that can easily arise out of an innocent communication attempt to increase the understanding of what we were trying to do? Here's my question as we get ready to go into the XP areas, but I want to just throw a question at you. And I'm going to start this off with the panel. How can language and culture be a barrier to communication? That's the question I'd like to just throw at you real quick to just see what your thoughts are in that area. How can language and or culture be a potential barrier to communication? Some cultures have uh, a different style of joking and um, say in England or Ireland they may joke about many things and make fun of themselves. Um, in America we might think of that as making fun of the other person. Mm -hmm. Oh, good, good, good response. Any yeah. others? Some cultures uh, like to get up real close to you when you're talking here in America. That's just not done. Space. space Absolutely. Absolutely. I learned that in New York. If you don't like crowds, stay out of New York, right? Stay out of Chicago. Go to stereotyping here, Wyoming, where there are no people. Uh, go to Kansas. Go to the, some of those places. Uh, I, I also learned just growing up as a military brat that if I need milk, you know, everybody knows milk comes from a, no, it comes from a carton. That's how I grew up. I grew up that if I needed milk, I will never drink milk from a cow because it comes from a carton. That's how I, I was brought up. But that's just nothing wrong with that. Any other thoughts, Rocky? Uh, okay. Thank you for your feedback. And as I stated, even to that question earlier, if you have any comments or questions or any additional observations about how language and culture can be a potential barrier to communication, please, by all means, send your facts in and we will address that as it comes in. Let's take a look at a third potential barrier to communication. This barrier is called status and authority. Now, all of us have driven down the street with our seatbelts on. We're not on our cell phone. Our hands are at the 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock position, and we're going the posted speed limit or driving according uh, to conditions. We see a photograph of a police car. We still instinctively slow down. We see a police car on the side of the road. We still instinctively slow down. It's almost like we have some type of a guilty, guilty conscience. But when we communicate, we have a tendency to phrase our words carefully when it deals with status and authority. It seems like respect is almost at the top of our list. Status and authority, management, for example. If we're dealing with senior management, it seems like our attitudes and what we say is a little bit different in comparison to when we are just shooting the breeze with our coworkers. We're very purposeful when we are communicating with our management. If the mayor or the town city manager or someone of that nature were to walk in here, and it seems that our attitudes and our behaviors will start to change. There perhaps won't be as much joking around and so on. But we also recognize that when it comes to others who have status and authority, such as a judge or our parents or teachers, whether formal or informal, it kind of senses us to what we say and what we do, how we say it and how we do it. Even though that person may say, hey, you know, I know I'm a judge, but, you know, I'm off duty right now, so let's just kind of let your hair down. It's still not the same anymore. And so status and authority can create a barrier to communication because... I may want to tell you something, but I'm afraid that what I say may be taken out of context, or I'm afraid that what I might say may come back and haunt me. So I may simply tell you what you want to hear. I was doing a program with the town of Gilbert about a few months ago, and I told them about being honest with our communication regardless of who we are dealing with. And I told them that if your boss, your, your company boss, actually walked in here and was just excited about everything and he brought out a photograph of his newborn grandchild and he brought that photograph out and your first impression was oh my gosh what is that is it human there's only one eye on that bad boy all kinds of little things that's what you're thinking but what do you tell him when he or she asks you what do you think about my new grandchild 
What do you think? What do we tell them? Pretty baby. Pretty baby. What else? It's a blessing. It's a blessing. I had one person say, wow, it's different. But <laughs> what you're really doing here is now you are now adding to the problem because now our communication is not being truthful whatsoever. If I tell him or her the truth, then it may come back and haunt me. So I'll tell them what they want to hear, and that's where the problem comes in. We've got to have a same type of relationship with status and authority without compromising our respect, but being able to be absolutely clear to ensure that the message that is sent is consistent with the message that is received, and the receiver also responds with understanding. The next area is the area on perceptions. Perceptions, rumors, propaganda, opinions. You know, people believe a lot of that stuff. That's the reason why uh, news rags and I, uh, newspapers like, you know, the propaganda papers that you see at the, at the grocery stores and the checkout lanes, that's why they, they, they make a lot of money. I mean, I was reading just the other day and I was in the checkout lane that scientists are shaving the hair off of babies so they can look like newborn babies to give to parents who are looking to adopt kids. And I'm thinking, how dumb, you know, but people believe those types of things. I thought is a classic statement. It leads to bias, and bias leads to stereotypes, and that's what creates problems. Rumors can lead to breakdowns. One's perceptions is one's reality. And our perceptions need to be as close to the truth as they possibly can. Because when we are missing or there are gaps in information, then we have a tendency to fill it in ourselves without actually getting the whole truth. The next two go hand in hand. Likes and dislikes. This is part of our value system. Our parents are perhaps our greatest influence in the development of our values. But we also must realize that there are other influence throughout our lives that influence the development of our values our teachers, our significant others, our clergy, uh, our friends. But even with today's generation, games and video games, televisions, uh, friendships or peers, all of these things continue to develop our values. Dr. Morris Massey out of Colorado University, a values guru, would often say that what you are is what you were when you were value programmed. And then he would go on to say simply that what you are right now is your parents fault but what you become is your own unfortunately our values can lead to significant conflict with others for example gender I can't work for a female boss I can't have a female boss working for uh, uh, telling me what to do or I can't work for those type of people well I can't understand him because he doesn't speak English all of these things are biases that can lead to stereotypes which are part of our values rich or poor careers our life mates all of these things are influenced our decisions are influenced by our value system now Here's the second question I would like to ask you. How can, and I'm going to throw this once again in our panel, and as I throw this question out, I want to remind you out there, if you have any questions or comments, feel, please feel free to fax those in to us. How can one's values be a communication barrier? How can your values be a barrier to communication? Yes, ma'am. Jeannie. If somebody is um, speaking to you in a nonverbal way that you don't understand, you may think it's disrespectful or deceitful, and you mm -hmm. may create in your mind uh, a value judgment of that person. They may not know that they're doing it. Exactly. Good, good comment. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Any comments? Anyone else? How can, your, how can your values actually be a conflict? Have you ever experienced any conflict based on what you believe, like, for example, your religious beliefs or beliefs about anything else that you might have? I think probably if you have a very sense of honesty mm -hmm. and you're working for someone who wants to be, I don't want to say deceptful, but 
um, it doesn't want to tell the whole truth. Exactly. Just kind of sugarcoated. Mm -hmm. You might have some difficulties with that because mm -hmm. if you're not a sugarcoated kind of person, you're not going to want to sugarcoat things. So you'd probably be more direct. You want to be more direct, and if you're being instructed, hey, you have to make it look good, mm -hmm. that could be a conflict for people. Who would be at fault then if you have the strong values? If my strong values were simply that I've always believed that A cannot happen. But the reality of today is that B is actually happening. Who has the problem? Does B have to change for me, or do I have to change for it? For example, if your coworkers were all male, okay? And they might be, I don't know. <laughs> well, obviously they're not. But if your coworkers were all male, and obviously you're female, but your value says, no, I can only work with females. So what should the boss do? get rid of all the males and bring in all females, or you're going to have to make the adjustment. Make the adjustment? Make the adjustment. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, my wife and I, we've been married for 25 years, and the way I was raised was simply that that's how I was raised, that women do not wear dresses, women do not wear skirts, women will support their husbands, women will not curse, women will not smoke. And, of course, I met my wife. And she said, cancel this one, cancel that one, cancel that one, this one, and that one there. I had to make the adjustment. I had to choose either adjust my values or I'm going to have the problem. That's where change really comes in. And that's where maturity and growing really comes in. I remember back in the 1970s when I had that big, gigantic Jimi Hendrix hairdo. And my daughter would simply say right now, she, she can't envision me with hair right now. But... I had a big Jimi Hendrix hairdo, and I can imagine my parents said, oh my goodness, where did I go wrong? And I have the behavior, had all of those type of behaviors. But as we go from then until now, you'll start to see various types of values start to change, you know, when it comes to technology, when it comes to a lot of things. Uh, in the 90s, for example, we have the yuppies. Well, I look at now the year 2000 and beyond, we have a new breed of people, a new breed of values. We have what I call WOFs, W-O-O-Fs, which is well-off older folks. And we have what we call puppies, which are poor urban professionals. Uh, and we have skippies, school kids with pagers and purchasing power. And all of these things influence our values in a, a great way. Absolutely. Thank you again for your feedback and your participation. Let's take a look at our emotional state. Remember at the beginning, as a part of a definition for interpersonal communication, I said that we must be responsible and accountable for our behavior at all times. Emotional state means simply moods, good or bad. We can be in good moods or we can be in bad moods. That can be a barrier to communication. Hey, I just had a bad day. I was up late at night, and I've had problems, and when I come into work, the last thing I want is some customer coming to me and said, I want it now. I'm just not in the mood for it right now. That obviously will affect the quality of communication that I have with that individual. We can choose to be angry. We can choose to be happy. We can choose to be excited. We can choose to be frustrated. We can choose to be bored. All of these things are part of our emotional state and more, and they can easily be a barrier to communication. In addition to the emotional state is our physical state. <sighs> we could be tired. We could be stressed. We can be very energetic. We can be hungover. We may even have perhaps a, 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 dis, a physical limitation, a, a disability such as perhaps hearing or any of those other types of things. There's all kinds of things that can actually hinder our effectiveness when it comes to communication. Some of these we do have control over and some of these we may not have actual control over. One of the great ones that I like and I have a tendency sometimes, especially with large organizations or large gatherings, is to take advantage of this one here. It's the feelings about the speaker or feelings about the receiver. If I don't like you, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with you. I'm going to say what I have to say, and I'm going to move on. And I'm, you may not even like my tone. If I do like you, I may 
spend a little bit more time for you. But I can guarantee you, it's just almost like being in the entertainment industry. You have a, a, a well-known entertainer, a singer, and they can come out with anything, but because you know who that singer is, your chances are you're going to give it a shot. It must be good. We assume that because the other stuff was good, this is going to be good. But at the same time, if the person is an unknown, then we may not want to take the chance or take the risk to find out exactly what this person is all about. This is nothing but biases. If I don't like this speaker, I'm not going to sign up for this class. If I don't like this speaker, I'm going to tune out perhaps more than I'm going to tune in. If I can't stand this speaker because I know his or her past, then I'm going to discredit many of the things that this person has to say. But this speaker, oh man, she is really good. I'm going to be very attentive. I am going to be very participative into what he or she has to say. And he or she has my respect all the way through. This one is very popular. This one, well, you know, I remember a class before and he wasn't any good. So uh, these are ways that can create barriers. And even though that speaker has something very important, critical to say, we may not hear it because of this particular barrier to communication. Let's go to our next slide. Our next slide really tries to take it a little bit more into body language. Our body language. Now, before we even read anything on that slide, here's a final question I have for you. And then in just a few moments, we're going to show a videotape. But the question I have for you, if you look at the, the uh, object there on the, on your, in your handout on the left side, it says face-to-face. -face. Tone of voice is 38%. Your words are 7%. And your body language is 55%. It's, to me, it reminds me of a child when the child says, no, daddy, I don't have to go to the bathroom. And yet you see the child dancing all over the place. You sure you don't have to go to the bathroom? No, I don't have to go to the bathroom. Somehow you believe what you see versus what you hear. Why is body language so critical to communication? Why is your body language so important? A lot of times it's hard to verbalize what you're feeling and so your body language does it for you. Yes, it does. It, it definitely does it for you. How is, how is body language? Why is it so critical to communication? What, what people see is um, it probably hits them before the, your words hit them. So they're getting a picture uh, before they're hearing the message. <laughs> so if you're at a customer service counter, as an example, and a customer walks up to you and you got your glass at the end of your nose and say, yeah, it's going to help you next. What message are we sending to that customer with our body language? Go home. Yeah, I'm bored. I, I don't have time for this. Look at the page there on the body language on page five. And it says, for example, without exchanging a word, you can guess what the service person feels about you, the customer in the following situations. The bank teller whose eyes rolls in exasperation when you bring in the loose change you have collected. That's me. I do it on a regular basis, perhaps once every six months, all the change that my daughter uh, collects. I don't have time to roll that stuff. They have counters at the bank, so I bring all of that change, even though there's a long line, and I can imagine what they're thinking. The doctor who ignores you and stares at your chart while you explain your symptoms. And they sit there and they're looking at your chart. They look back at you. They look at your chart and they're saying, hmm, I wonder what's going on in your mind when that doctor is doing that. Or the painful expression on the face of the department sales associate 10 minutes before closing when a familiar customer walks in to, to, just to browse around. Even though that service provider says, oh, please come in. I can imagine what their body language is really saying. There perhaps is some heavy breathing light. There's perhaps hoping that this person will hurry up and get out of there. We're going to show you a video in just a second. And I'd like to just set this video up for you. It's a short video clip. It's not the newest video, but the points that it's going to make about nonverbal communication and body language are just as current for today. And basically what you're going to have is that simply you're going to have a couple of short meetings. What I would like for you to do is pay special attention to the body language of each and every person, but not just specifically the body language, but also tones of voice 
and other things that may somehow be passed by if you're not really paying attention. Let's take a look at this video clip. Everything we do communicates. We communicate to others through words, of course, but also through our appearance, our facial expressions, the postures we assume, the clothes we wear. In organizations, even such things as office decor, furniture arrangement, and, and lighting communicate subtle messages to employees and customers about the way an organization approaches its day-to-day -day objectives. What are all these messages telling us? A lot. In reality, what we convey and perceive through nonverbal communication is often more important than what is put into words. Uh, excuse me, people, people, if we want to uh, complete this agenda before dark, we need to get back to work. Today, we place enormous emphasis on the written and spoken word while the profound effects of nonverbal communication right. are often right. overlooked. The presentation. Now, as I've told you, this uh, proposal is for a very important client, which is why I've uh, seen fit to handle it personally. Now, there's been some talk about uh, cost overruns. I'm not uh, going to make any rash judgments until I see those budget figures from George. Wait a minute, where's George? I'm here. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, let's have that budget. Oh, um. Uh... Now, uh, now, I know there's a concern that we've gone over a little, but in this case, I think you'll agree. It's just... <laughs> hmm. Well, uh... We're within shouting distance of our contingency, I think. Wait a minute. Weren't we going to implement those new pricing controls I mentioned? Well, I thought so. Elliot's office distributed the memo and that detailed outline. I saw that. But it didn't include any projections. How does so nonverbal communication work? It did. The way we exchange messages without the use of words involves a complex and subtle interplay of factors. So, in lieu of that, I guess we'd best review the budget, such as it is. <clears throat> Graphics, 22.59. Photography, 41.5. Over Vocal intonation. 18. Timing. Materials, 18.90. Facial expressions. Eye movements, body position. Each of these may confirm or obscure what we are saying with words. Outside labor, 3617. Now, don't misunderstand. I think we're okay on this as long as we land this account. <coughs> Just want to know how we got so far over without anyone checking. George, accounting should have spotted this. What do you have to say? Um, <clears throat> well, I uh, uh, don't uh, quite know what to say. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, we had such a heavy load uh, uh, laid on us that, uh, I mean... With In general, and, and our and words our deliver best, explicit uh, objective uh, information. Our, our, best book our bodies being convey how uh, we feel about just it. Just saying that we had our, our hands full. Um, when we do use words to describe our emotions, we are often describing not so much what we feel as what we think we ought to feel. A verbal apology, for example, may be accompanied by a nonverbal expression of suppressed rage or hostility. If it means anything, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, but I, I, I must point out in all fairness, I lost nearly a third of my staff in the cutbacks, and wasn't that about the time they were doing the remodeling? A minor inconvenience, at worst. Didn't affect me in the slightest. <laughs> now, look, look I'm, I'm not complaining. It's just uh, we were all inconvenienced here, right? I, I've, 
When our words contradict the unspoken messages contained in our actions, well, I had to others may begin to mistrust our words and rely almost entirely on what we do. Now, there isn't a department in this organization that tried harder to keep this uh, proposal under budget. Um, now, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to weasel out of my responsibility. Uh, it's just that uh, I did have some, uh, some uh, personnel problems and, uh, and well, some pers personal problems, too. Um, I just don't know uh, what, uh, what more I can, uh, I can say. Yes, well, <clears throat> we'll go over this one-on-one, -on -one, George. Um, in the meantime, I think we all need to review the presentation at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. It is indeed not so much what we say as the way we say it. And actions do speak louder than words. Ah! Ah! Communication is a synonym for life. As infants, we learn to communicate our thoughts, needs, and feelings through nonverbal means long before we have the words to do so. Ultimately, we begin to sense the unique capacity of words to bring us into the larger world of those we love and desire to imitate. Learning to master language is perhaps the most prodigious task we ever face and the most profoundly motivated. Our educational system emphasizes written and spoken language, the mastery of which will occupy us for life. However, there is no corresponding attention paid to the nonverbal language that the child knows instinctively. The result? We may tend to disregard intellectually what is said nonverbally. However, subconsciously, we are affected profoundly by it. Consequently, in our later work lives, when there is a disparity between what is spoken through words and what is said nonverbally, the result is almost always confusion, misdirection, and a lack of productivity. At the extreme, words themselves can become ritual, and our true messages may be conveyed wholly by nonverbal means. Well, love. Uh... What do we think of the presentation, in general? Uh, great. Just great. Price, you've done it again, Miss Benning. Boy, I mean, it's, it's right there. That accounts in the bank, if you ask me. <laughs> I'm very impressed, very well. It's worth every penny. Terrific. Since very it proud. is very often taboo to, to express point. true feelings, attitudes, uh, and motives verbally, in such yes. instances, words may be used not to reveal, but rather to conceal. Oh, we could use a little work, uh, clean up the graphics, and rework some of the copy. No problem. A minor noodle. That's all it really needs, and that can all wait till a client approves it. Of course. The client should be able to see through a few little glitches here and there. After all, it's the concept that sells. By encouraging this nonverbal conspiracy to cover our true feelings, we may become isolated from the honest feedback needed to avoid costly mistakes and errors. Well, thanks. Wish me luck. I make the official presentation to the client at three this afternoon. While there is no grammar, no Okay, welcome back. You saw in that short video clip some classic examples of nonverbal communication and body language. And two points that I really would like to just throw at you. Towards the end, during that second meeting, you saw some classic examples of management authority barriers. What were some things that you saw in that video about management and authority? They were not saying what they were thinking, obviously. These people, furrowed brow, pained look, and saying, oh, yeah, great. That's not what they were thinking, obviously. Mm -hmm. why, why, do, why do you propose that they did that? Why didn't you, they just say, 
that program is the absolute worst program I've ever heard. Why did they not tell the truth? Fear. fear. The fear. Fear of what? Uh, Again, we're dealing with management and authority. Fear of what? Fired or demoted or not promoted. Yes. And, and it may not even be true. It may not even be true. And then, of course, the, the other gentleman, you know, um, I forget his name, but I believe he was the budget person. Somehow, he didn't display a lot of confidence in what he said, how he said it. What kind of examples do you recall seeing that he did that showed that he wasn't confident? He was twitching a lot, kind of wringing his hands, just really looking concerned and apologizing an awful lot as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just really didn't seem too comfortable with anything going on there. How about his voice? Was it authoritative? Was it firm? Okay. What happened to his cup? You remember his coffee cup sitting on his table? Why do we have these type of cups? <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and our nonverbals sometimes speak much more louder, much more clear, much more firmer than our verbal communication. Now, that's very easy to look at it that way because as you see on the screen there or even on your handout page, it says that 55% of our body language is communicated. And so people believe what they see versus what they hear. If there is an inconsistency, if there is a consistency, then the chances of you having an effective interaction are greatly increased. However, in our technology age, one other point for us to realize is simply this. The minute you pick up the phone, the game changes. Body language disappears, and your tone of voice becomes 86% of the story. Down at the bottom, it says words. It should be, I think, on your handout, does it say 7%? It should say 14%. So you can you know, go ahead and make that change. But 86% is now the tone of voice. That tells something about people who are on the phones with you. For example... At the bottom of your page, it simply says a monotone and flat voice tells the customer that I'm bored. I have no interest whatsoever in what you're talking about. If that's what they're getting on the phone, and I've gotten that on the phone, and I've always asked the person, I said, listen, if I'm boring you, please let me talk with somebody else. How about that second one that says, slow speed and low pitch communicates the message I'm depressed and just want to be left alone and if you're the customer service provider I, I feel sorry for the customer coming in to see you a high-pitched and empathetic, emphatic voice says I'm enthusiastic about this subject they want to be with you and receive the service from you. And an abrupt and very loud voice says, I'm angry and I'm not open to input. What do you want? And the customer may feel like, what did I do? And then lastly on that page, high pitch and drawn out, I don't believe what I'm hearing. You know, various schools of thought will tell you when you're on the phone with a customer, smile on the phone. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Make the worst, angriest face that you possibly can. Just look grumpy. I want you to look so grumpy that you will scare our cameraman. And then look to the person as you're looking grumpy and as sincerely as you can, be excitedly say, good morning. Good morning. Isn't that exciting? Mm -hmm. That sounded awful. Now smile and say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> you know, even though we may be in a bad mood sometimes, sometimes, you know, the, the one character that I cannot stand, but I have an eight-year-old daughter, and it's so strange that even today my daughter, uh, she was very concerned because uh, she asked me to do something with her today, and I told her I can't. I have to go to the court to do a program. And somehow she got a different message because the message that she got when she started crying said, Oh, Daddy, what did you do? How come you got to go to court? 
and I, I lost in that translation. But I find that when we are happy, when we can smile, that it also is therapeutic to us. If we can somehow take whatever is putting us in a bad mood, whatever is causing us to frown, because remember, you only have one opportunity to make a good first impression. And that's why it was very clear that when we talked about the basic communication process, at the bottom of that page, it simply said to say what you mean and mean what you say without conflict. You can avoid some of that conflict if you can take all of those attitudes that you may have and suppress those, that when you're talking on the phone or when you're talking with someone in person, that you are aware of how you come across with your body language. A desk that you sit behind, for example, communicates something about you. How you decorate your office communicates something about you. Your handshake communicates something about you. So let's take a look at this next slide. The impact of verbal and nonverbal communication. Verbal communication is heard. Whether you understand it or not, it is heard heard. One of the language that I think is the most difficult language that my wife speaks fluently is French. And she speaks it regularly, just speaks French. And she will, and then, and then she does sign language, where I don't understand any kind of sign language. We go to a certain place, and she'll need something. We're crossed out from each other. Instead of her yelling at me, she's doing sign language. Then I get mad. I don't understand that sign language stuff. And, but it's still heard. Sign language is seen, but it also can be heard. It is interpreted. It's also observed. The verbal communication can be familiar words, phrases, utterings, or it also can be unfamiliar words and phrases and utterings, like, oh, my goodness. <clears throat> All kinds of things that we can do, any things that we can say that people can hear, they can sense we're in a good mood, or we're in a bad mood. That these problems will just continue to happen at various types of times. Verbal communication is absolutely critical. In addition to verbal communication is our nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication is observed communication. Nonverbal communication can also include sight and touch and sound and smell and taste, intuition, perception, it's body language, our gestures, our pace, our eyes, our time, our non-personal non-verbals, our space. I think Martha had said that sometimes when people communicate, they like to get up close and personal into our zones of interaction, our personal space. It communicates a lot about people. Going or should I say, I did a class, this was in Chicago, two years ago, over there at the Sheer, uh, Sears Tower on Wacker Drive, and it was dealing with difficult people. In that class, every participant, because I asked the question, every participant in that class was asked, why are you here? My supervisor made me come because he said I was difficult. And I said, well, what do you hope to get out of this class? Nothing. So I did a little experiment with the class. Because, see, if you can play with the person's mind, you can control their behavior. I know many of us have been in a closed room where perhaps we've done something that maybe it would create an uncomfortable type of situation. I study human behavior. My seventh college degree is going to be my second doctorate on abnormal behavioral psychology. And what I like to do is do things and break the rules. I love to get in elevators. See, when you get in an elevator, you're not supposed to talk to people you don't know. Not me. When I was in the Sears Tower, all I would simply do is turn around. And I start to look at people. Don't say a word. Just look at them. Watch all the fidgeting and the discomfort. And then finally, I would say something such as dramatic as, Wow, you really have nice shoes. I bet you're very proud of them. 
all of a sudden you start to see people get off an elevator uh, floors that they had no plan on getting off on but it was something different I love to study human behavior when I'm walking down the street I love talking out loud even though there's no one else around because I like to see how people respond to me I've seen people walk across the street just to get away from me but that's perfectly okay when dealing with difficult people, I get them out of their comfort zone. I, the example that I used in that particular class was I just simply said, oh my gosh, somebody did something that they shouldn't have done. And I start looking at perhaps the loudest person in the class. And suddenly everybody also start keying in on that person. Now nothing ever happened, but I just oh, I smell something, I look at a person, now not only do everybody start looking at that person, but then all of a sudden, mysteriously, others start smelling something that is not there. But it takes a loud person, it makes them very, very quiet, and even invisible sometimes for the remainder of that class. Communication can have a very dramatic impact on the success of your interactions within your organizations. Understanding the impact of both verbal and nonverbal communication is absolutely vital. My wife loves to tell me, after 25 years, she says, Honey, how come you never tell me you love me? I said, Jay, we've been married for 25 years. Shouldn't I tell you something? That's not what she wants to hear. And I was watching the World Cup the other day when the U.S. was playing, and she was standing in front of the TV and say, How come you never tell me you love me? I said, Jay, not now. I'm watching the game. And then she won't move until I tell her. And I say, okay, I love you. Now, I said what she wanted to hear, but she's upset because I didn't say it the way she wanted to hear it. And now she's mad, and now I have to be able to deal with that problem. When we are dealing with our customers, we can do the same thing. We can love our customers. Now, I'm not saying that you're supposed to tell your customers you love them, but you need to give them that type of service where it's personalized, where you then tell that customer that you are important to me and I care about you. Being aware of the impact of your verbal communication and your nonverbal communication and how they must be consistent with each other is the key. At the bottom of page six, there are two questions that I would like for you to simply reflect on for a few moments. We're going to take our first break in just a few moments, but I want you to reflect first on those two questions. The first question is, what potential problems result when nonverbal communication conflict with verbal communication? And then secondly, what will be the impact on eternal organizational communication also with your public? And so while you're out there on break, I want to remind you that you're welcome to send in your comments, your questions, or your observations at 602-542-3721. We're going to take a 10-minute break, and we'll return in approximately 10 minutes. Have a good break.